So our next speaker is I've got her, is Leslie McFarlane. She is a senior UX designer and years in UX, uh, working as a researcher, interaction designer, and information architect. She recently transitioned from software and AI UX to the UX of architecture and interior design. Uh, Leslie couldn't get her screen sharing to work, so I will be controlling her slides, which means she will be telling me when to click them. Over to you, Leslie. <laughs> Thanks, Debbie. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie, and I just want to say thank you for being patient and for sticking around to attend my talk, which I've named Bridging the Physical and Digital Worlds, Combining UX with Architecture. So um, why have I made this presentation? Because I realize that it's not very common to think of UX as working in tandem with architecture. Well, uh, you know, in short, I find architecture as a design discipline fascinating. And one of the things that it shares with all the other design disciplines that as UXers we're accustomed to dealing with is that it absolutely has to consider people. So Debbie, if you could go ahead and click to the next slide. So on this slide, I have a quote from an engineer, Dr. Prabhat Singh. And he says, we spend a lot of time designing the bridge, but not enough time thinking about the people who are crossing it. Now, as a UXer, this resonates with me. We're always talking about, you know, focusing on people, understanding what they're doing and why they're doing it. So this really gets at that. Um, go ahead and click to the next slide, please. I'm trying. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So on this slide, I have a quote from a design professor, Robert L. Peters. He says, design creates culture, culture shapes values, and values determine the future. So these two quotes, thinking about them, um, they sort of got my mind wondering on two particular things. And if you go, go ahead and uh, click to the next slide. First question that popped into my mind was, if we design spaces without understanding the people who inhabit them, then what kind of culture are we creating? Next question that popped into my head immediately after that was, if we design spaces based on inaccurate knowledge, then how are we impacting culture? So really that whole thought process is kind of what inspired me to create this presentation. And you know, while these questions do seem geared toward physical design, we are more and more starting to see a joining of the digital world and real world spaces. So for me, it really makes sense that UXers and architects pair up. Now, to that end, thankfully, our disciplines share some complementary processes that make that pairing possible. So go ahead and click forward. Uh, to start off the real meat of this presentation, I'd like to open with a brief discussion of our individual design processes. So a UX design process that I typically subscribe to, and then the architectural design process that's used in-house at STL where I do my UX work. And then go into a little bit about how we merge the UX process with the design process. So go ahead and go forward. So for me, I always describe a UX process that has four steps. And those four steps are explore, hypothesize, test, and implement. Explore really for me is a step focused on understanding a problem space. So what issues are there? What should you be solving? And who are the people that are involved? Hypothesize is translating your information from the exploration findings into design ideas. Then test refers to the validating of design ideas with implement being making the design ideas a reality. So be that taking it to visual design and then into code or building out an actual physical product. Next slide, please. So for the architects where I work, um, we looked then at the three-step in-house design process. And that process is investigate, analyze, and design. So investigate essentially looks at, you know, what is the purpose of the space and who will use it? Analyze looks at the surrounding environment. So, you know, what's the soil, the weather? Uh, what are the other buildings in the area? What is the overall lot that you're building on? So things of that nature. And then design is, you know, creating structure, selecting materials and planning layouts. So as we were working to sort of merge our processes, um, the synergies seem kind of obvious to us. So can you go ahead, go forward, please? 
Um, the first obvious complementary point between UX and architecture, at least in our minds, occurred at the start of both of our processes with the explore and investigate steps. And this is mostly because the methods that both UX and architecture can deploy at this point are so similar. And for architecture, it's mainly observation, whereas for UX folks, you know, observation is just one of many methods that we can apply. Uh, you know, depending on the nature of the project, UXers working in architecture and interior design can also conduct interviews, they can do focus groups, and like I've even done digital ethnographies. So we can work in tandem, but also as UX, we can provide further support with some of our other um, methods that we're accustomed to using. Go ahead and go forward, please. So the next point of synergy or complement between our two disciplines occurs at the tail end of our processes. So for architects, that would be the design phase. And then for UX, that would be the test phase, which kind of makes sense because you test your designs. So for example, um, you know, if you're looking at just sketches, UX can take those and work those into storyboards and do storyboarding with, you know, clients, with potential users of spaces. Um, if you actually have real prototypes of a space, so some places you can actually build up the walls to get the general layout, or you can do VR. Um, we can do eye tracking data if you have head mounted devices for eye tracking, or you can even do sketch studies of space prototypes. So go ahead and go forward, please. So with these two complementary points of the UX design process and the architectural design process pointed out, um, we developed our blended or hybridized process. Again, it's four steps, explore, analyze, design, and test. So explore, again, just understanding the problem space, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of what's out there. The analysis allows the architects to take not only the information that we turn over from investigating people, but also consider, you know, those physical factors of the environment as well. They can take that and translate it into that into the designs, and then we can come along and work together to test the designs. So now that I've provided an overview of the relevant processes and, you know, laid out our hybridized process, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some specific collaboration opportunities, and these opportunities are going to start out looking at physical dimensions because those will really give you the framework for how that translates and incorporates that digital dimension. So next, please. So when applying UX with architecture, there really are two main aspects of space to consider. Uh, the first is programming, what we know as layout. And layout's important from a UX perspective because it influences movement through a space and also how people can interact within a space. So go ahead and go forward, please. The second aspect is materiality. So essentially, you know, what materials you're using in an environment. Like here, you know, you've got lots of warm wood colors, you've got glass, you've got metal. That's what we're talking about with materiality. And materiality can impact perceptions of a space. So, you know, whether you feel comfortable and welcomed in a space or, you know, whether you think a space is rather cold or off-putting. But beyond that, it also has implications for ergonomics as well. And I'll get into that um, very soon. So while it is possible to consider programming and materiality individually, um, some very interesting UX topics can arise when they're viewed together. So if you can go ahead and click forward. A very, uh, a very common and very thorny combination of programming and materiality arises when you look at queue management. So as I'm talking, take a look at this picture. Um, you know, anybody who's flown internationally, uh, you've, you've experienced this going through arrival immigration lines can be a bit of a cattle call, I'm not going to lie. But with queue management, uh, the focus is really on making the time spent in line more tolerable. And this is typically done by improving time perception. So what that means is making time seem like it's passing faster instead of more slowly. And there's two tactics for doing that. Um, you begin with giving people some indication of how long their queue time is. And then you get them to focus on other things in the environment. So literally focus on everything but standing in line. That's essentially what queue management is. So um, as people enter a queue, 
you know, giving them an estimate of what their wait time could be. And then if anything unexpected pops up that could potentially impact the wait time, like making it longer, let's say, you know, letting them know upfront so people can adjust their expectations. Where it gets, um, oh, go, go back, there you go. <laughs> Where it gets a little bit interesting with um, queue management is getting people not to focus on standing in lines. So that's where layout and materiality really start to shine and where we can have good interaction with architects. Because you want to lay out lines in ways that, um, you know, it, that encourage people to interact with, you know, the people they're traveling with or even with others in line, depending on, you know, what the line is for or bring them you know, throughout the environment in a way while they're waiting in line that, you know, really catches their, their eye with points of interest. So, you know, interesting pictures, interesting signs, things of that nature. But it, it also requires using materials that maximize comfort. So, you know, you want to have windows with special glazing so that people, if they're standing by windows, they don't get overheated or they don't get blinded by all the natural light. But you also want to use flooring that absorbs shock so people don't they don't get tired and become uncomfortable while standing in line and then all of a sudden they're focused on how miserable they feel standing in line and everything seems to take longer. So go ahead and go forward. Um, another interesting application of the interaction between layout and materiality is the impact it has on three key components of the environment. Uh, acoustics, lighting, and occasionally even scent. So acoustics, you know, obviously referring to sound. Sound waves have, you know, their own physical properties and depending on the types of materials used, sound can deteriorate and just not carry well in an area. Um, lighting can either be overpowering or not powerful enough. And then scent, this is usually having to do like when you have interior architecture that incorporates plants and things of that nature, that's when scent becomes a worry. So go ahead and go forward. So now that I've given an overview of the two aspects of architecture that UX can positively influence, I'm going to um, sort of ease in to infusing technology, bringing technology into physical spaces by reviewing at a very high level um, the concept of technology infused spaces. And so when I say technology infused spaces, I'm referring to things like, you know, the internet of things, um, the inclusion of dynamic signs, inclusion of interactive displays, and then things like ambient intelligence. So go ahead and go forward. So the internet of things or IOT is a topic that really is not evident as having a relationship to architecture. Um, you know, however, some aspects of IoT, they do require having beacons. So, you know, you may hear something like Bluetooth low energy beacons. Those are things that allow data to be sent along different key points in an area. Well, you don't want those beacons to actually detract from the design because you don't want them to look ugly. But also some people can be very skittish when they notice things like that. Um, they may think it's unnecessary, you know, tracking of them in the environment for whatever reason. So it's also, you know, a perception and a personal comfort thing where you have to be, um, you have to be aware of how those beacons are integrated into a space. So go ahead and go forward. So dynamic signs. Dynamic signs are interesting in that, you know, they can exist within an IoT ecosystem or they can even stand alone. And some dynamic signs may be interactive while others may not. Um, but with dynamic signs, it's not just an issue of placement and materials considerations, but also readability across distances. I mean, you don't wanna place a dynamic sign right you know, in front of a window in case you know, maybe your client has chosen particular screen materials. That interaction can make um, can make it very difficult to perceive what's on a sign, but also you have to worry about people of different ages, maybe even people who have different levels of visual acuity, you know, it, whether or not they can perceive a sign when it comes to things like dynamic signage. Go ahead and go forward. Then there's interactive displays. Um, incorporating interactive displays starts to cross into designing for exhibits, not always. You know, sometimes you can just have a singular display on a wall and that's all there is in the area that's interactive, but it's not uncommon 
to have multiple interactive displays that um, sort of guide the user in the area giving key pieces of information. So when you start getting into the application of interactive displays like that, then as a UXer, you have to start thinking about, you know, how do you create the physical path in the space? But then how do you build up the interactive displays along that path to structure information in a way that's interesting and keeps people moving along that same path? Uh, so go ahead and go forward. And then finally in this section, I'm gonna talk very briefly about ambient intelligence. So when UXers and architects work together around ambient intelligence, we're really looking at um, using sensors to adjust an environment to the people that are in it. Uh, you know, both architecture and UX, we're concerned with keeping people comfortable in environments. And AMI starts to get interesting in that regard because a lot of the sensors are invisible. So people don't actually know how the environment is being adjusted. They may even be completely oblivious to it. But you start looking at layout and, and materiality because those two things in combination impact when and how often adjustments to an environment need to be made. So, you know, think about it like, um, you know, in a work environment, an office environment, it may get really hot in midday for a couple of minutes and then everything starts to even out. That's a type of ambient intelligence. So go ahead and go forward. So the past several slides very much dealt with, um, you know, just sort of putting the digital world into the physical world, but architecture does view pure digital content as a viable design medium. And so that brings us to the final portion of my presentation today, which is on reality experiences. And, you know, there's a lot that can be said about this topic. However, I'm only going to look at very general applications of virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. So go ahead and go forward, please. So virtual reality or VR, it's, it's a popular prototyping tool within architecture. Um, and that's because it allows people to explore a space so that, you know, architects and UXers alike can understand how people respond to layout and how we should evaluate signage and wayfinding. And the nice thing about VR headsets, and I believe a good example of this is Oculus, um, some of them even include eye tracking. So you can add additional data to support or refute certain design decisions that have been made. But beyond that, um, there's a very large open source community that if you combine your VR headsets with other um, physiological response measures, like there are some devices out there that you can get on Amazon that will monitor your breathing, let's say. Um, you can bring all that data together, analyze it together, and then if you have good um, post-session interview questions, you can start to take your research, um, you know, cross some lines and go into the realm of neural architecture, which is really understanding how, you know, cognitively we respond to our physical environment. So go ahead and go forward, please. So next is augmented reality. Uh, and this is a very popular complementary tool for architecture, and it's deployed primarily as a navigation aid. Uh, and here's the reason for that. So when you're designing a space, you don't want to have signs everywhere. And beyond that, it may even be possible, it may even be impossible rather, that you can't have very many signs or signs at all. So you have to have some other way to get people information for moving around and successfully finding what they need. And the other nice thing about, um, about augmented reality is that you know, good, good navigation systems will also have cues in the physical environment. So that can be something about how you lay out your flooring or, you know, if you have um, an oculus set in your ceiling, which is essentially like a navigation compass set in glass in your ceiling. Um, the thing is, is people don't, um, they don't always look around in the environment. And sometimes the cues are so subtle that they don't immediately pick them up. So that's another reason why augmented reality can be 
um, such a great tool to be developed in tandem with architectural design. So next, please. So next up is mixed reality. And this is a way that architects can create virtual architecture in a space that has some limitations around physical structures. Now, uh, you know, unlike interactive signs, mixed reality really requires balancing, you know, potential paths in the physical world with virtual paths as defined by virtual architecture. Um, so, you know, if you're using to, you know, to dig in a little bit more about that, if you are using um, interactive displays, they're pretty much like up on a wall, they're up on physical elements. So you have a pretty clear line of sight as to where you're going and, you know, where you could potentially, you know, run into things that sometimes is not always going to be the case with um, mixed reality. So you really have to keep in mind the dimensions of the space and plan out your mixed reality environment around that. And um, go ahead and go forward. So that was everything um, I had for everyone today. I realized I kind of <laughs> flew through everything as uh, quickly as possible, but I mean, thank you again for joining my talk. And if you have any questions or anything, uh, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. So thank you.